then you'll get figures between 15 to 50 million years. On average, about 25 million years. See, it's a million, millions of years is a very long time. That's enough to erode continents to sea level in a few tens of millions of years. Here's a planation surface that's effectively untouched for 100 million years. There's something very inconsistent, something very wrong with that explanation. Obviously, these flat landscapes cannot be that old, but they are clear evidence, I believe, there's something very wrong with the dating methodology being used. And I believe the observations then, they're not proof of, but they fit very well, with the floodwaters retreating from the land during Noah's flood, the recessive stage of Noah's flood. High-speed water currents moving over very wide areas, carrying rocks of many sizes, planing surfaces flat, and gradually as waters lowered, planing surfaces flat at lower elevations and uh, grow moving from high altitudes towards sea level, that's exactly what we see today. Present-day erosion is too fast for planation surfaces to be tens of millions of years old, but they're great evidence for the flood. So much for planation surfaces. My final piece of evidence of geomorphology is what we would call water gaps. Many rivers, after travelling along a valley, will suddenly appear to turn from our point of view, and flow through a narrow gorge that cuts across some major barrier, like a, a ridge of land or a plateau or even a mountain range. And we call those resulting gorges or valleys water gaps. And you can see one at the top there, uh, where the Shoshone River, uh, starting at Yellowstone National Park in the USA, flows east straight through the Rattlesnake Mountains, as if they weren't there. But what's fascinating is that that river could easily have continued in a slightly more southerly route, gone round the mountains, where you see that low point on the slide at the bottom with the marked X. It's only a couple of miles away, and yet it didn't do that. It's a complete mystery why this Shoshone River should have continued eastward, oblivious, as it were, to the mountainous obstacle in its way, cutting this incredible gorge. Clearly, rivers do not flow uphill. But how could it have done so then? Here's another one. The Delaware Water Gap is probably the most famous one uh, if you were to study this. And you can clearly see in the schematic at the left-hand side showing a sort of topographical 3D view of a map and also the actual picture of the Delaware Water Gap, uh, how nice that looks. It's a, a lovely little feature. The deepest water gaps you see in the world are in the Himalayas. There are 11 major rivers that start in the northern Tibeto, uh, sorry, the southern Tibetan plateau and then plunge south straight through the Himalayas uh, in deep gorges. There's one that is almost four miles deep, about six kilometres deep, the Aran River flowing past south, uh, south past Mount Everest. A huge water gap, a deep gorge. Here's one flowing near Washington, USA. And it's cut straight through an anticline. That's where rocks, uh, sedimentary rocks, have been pushed up in a ridge. And uh, you can see a little inset picture of an anticline there. And you've got to imagine a river's cut through that. So water gaps are a mystery to uniformitarian geologists or actualists, people who argue for millions of years, because they cannot work out how a river would erode uphill. But why then does it seem to cut across a barrier, a formidable obstacle? There are various ideas, antecedent drainage, ancient drainage, that somehow was already there and it kept pace with uplift. But there are many different uh, models of, of trying to explain water gaps, perhaps even five of them, which compete with one another. The reason there are so many is because none of them really satisfy or really explain the evidence. But I believe that the biblical geological model of Taz Walker is very helpful here. I've already mentioned the recessive stage of the flood. We're imagining that part of the flood where the floodwaters would have been draining off the emerging continents into the newly forming ocean basins. First of all, the abative phase, then abative phase, and then the dispersive phase. And I think that's key to understanding features of planation and water gaps that we've looked at. The mountains rose up, remember, and the valley sank down, Psalm 104, verse 8. And so the water would have flowed as enormous sheets producing many planation surfaces, and then as the water continued to abate and new land was emerging beneath the floodwaters with earth movements, with tectonic activity, mountain folding, then there would have been a more channelised flow and they would have cut, in some cases, across those features that we see. 
And so here we are going to look at a little schematic in four stages to try to get you to picture this. Abated phase of the flood, the sheet phase of the flood, in other words, water flowing off the land in great sheets. And as we continue through this uh, schematic, the water flow is reducing now. It's a little bit shallower. And as you continue, you see these, uh, these sheets of water become shallower and then they become more channelized. And that's the dispersive phase of the flood. And then as we continue, we have the water now exposing land to view. Channelization here has the potential to erode valleys, to erode gorges, and because there's massive energy involved. There's a tremendous amount of energy in fast-moving water carrying a sediment load, in this case uh, including large rocks and so on, as we mentioned earlier. And then as we continue through the sequence, we have the last stage, which I've depicted here, where the mountain ranges that we see today begin to appear. When you find a, a, a surface, by the way, cut with a valley, which is then effectively hovering way above the water table, we call that a wind gap, because only wind passes through it today. That's a similar sort of feature. So uh, flow that's perpendicular to a barrier that's being raised up, which, but which is highly energetic, is able to then cut across that barrier. And as that barrier continues to be lifted and the waters continue to cut down, then the river that you see today is occupying a valley that was cut by fast-moving water, not cut by the river. Here's one more, just as I leave this subject. This is a V-shaped lovely water gap where the Susquehanna River is cutting through the Appalachian Mountains near Pencil in Pennsylvania, near Harrisburg. And as with planation services then, uh, uh, old earth geologists would have a problem explaining these water gaps. As I've said, those five different hypotheses used to explain them really do not uh, satisfy. But I believe the flood is a powerful uh, ex explanatory tool for explaining these features we see. Now, I've already said that the same evidence can be presented uh, and understood in different ways. And of course, this isn't going to convince everybody. But to argue that there's no evidence for global catastrophism of, the, of, of what we read in the flood of Noah, I believe, is to either be in ignorance of geology or to willfully deny the evidence. It depends which glasses you're wearing and the people you know as to whether this evidence will be seen as conclusive or at least plausible. You could sum it up like this. Someone standing on the rim of the Grand Canyon could say, uh, a lot of time, but a little bit of water lay down sediments and carve the canyon. In other words, time is, the, is of the essence here. Another person thinking in terms of rapid catastrophic processes in the days of Noah, a huge flood, is thinking of a relatively short time, huge energies, huge water velocities, incredible uh, tectonic movements and so on, and sees the evidence from a different perspective. And it's certainly not the case that catastrophism is something you have to read into the rocks. Here is Ernst Mayer, someone who was one of the leading evolutionists of the last century, who died at just over 100 years old. And he said the reason why catastrophism was adopted by virtually all of the truly productive leading geologists in the first half of the 19th century is that the facts seem to support it. I can assure you, no friend of creationists. Derek Eger, who was a professor at geology, uh, of geology at Swansea University, where I did some geology, died in 1993. And he was, I can assure you, an anti-creationist, most certainly uh, a neo-catastrophist, though, someone who argued for time passing between the layers, but argued for the layers themselves forming quickly. He said to his fellow evolutionists, his fellow long ages, these interesting words. In other words, we've allowed ourselves to be brainwashed into avoiding any interpretation of the past that involves extreme and what might be termed catastrophic processes. Now, I can assure you, he believed in millions of years of evolution up to his death. But here we see that catastrophism is born out of the evidence of the rocks. It's not something we have to impose upon the rocks in willful denial of the geological evidence. I've already alluded to these verses. I won't read them again. But Peter predicts that in conjunction with the denial of the second coming of Jesus Christ in 2 Peter 3, verses 3 and 4, that people will argue that all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. And as I've said to you, he points out 
a willful ignorance, a willful denial of the wealth of evidence. And I'm slightly reading into his words, but he says that people willingly are ignorant of God creating the world out of water and the destruction of that former world by water. The rocks speak eloquently, don't they? If you think about these scriptures of the judgment of God for human sin, no wonder, and quite understandably, the person who doesn't want to accept God as their creator and to whom they're accountable does not find it uh, comfortable to believe in a God who judged the world with a global catastrophic flood. And it reminds me of the need that all of us have, which is to get right with God through repentance and through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because another judgment awaits all humanity at the end of the ages when our Lord Jesus Christ will return to this earth. Something which Peter goes on to talk about in 2 Peter chapter 3. The rocks and their fossil record then need not be understood as the remains of millions of years. Indeed, I would say they cannot be understood as the remains of millions of years in a way that's consistent with Scripture and with an understanding of the Gospel. Because the fossil record represents death and bloodshed and suffering. And though, therefore these long ages of time that, that some people argue before Adam undermine the Christian Gospel, which make clear that death is a consequence of Adam's sin and ours. And it's not something, therefore, that would have preceded that very good declaration of God at the time of his creation being completed on day six. And in Genesis 1.31, we read God's words, very good. No, the rocks and the fossils speak powerfully, I believe, of the flood of Noah and perhaps some local catastrophism since. And of the flood judgment of God because of man's sin and rebellion. And Noah's flood explains those evidences very well. It's a wonderful picture. is the ark of Noah of the salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ who provided a way of escape in those antediluvian times and does for us today through Christ. So I would argue in conclusion, and thank you for your patience, um, that as Christians, our thinking needs to be, in every area, firmly based on the truth of the Bible, the authority of the Word of God, including where it speaks to geomorphology and geology and such like. Facts that Christ and the New Testament writers believed and taught to be true, and the rocks and the fossils give eloquent testimony to these things. God's word is true from the very beginning. Thank you very much. Then you'll re get figures between 15 to 50 million years. On average, about 25 million years. See, it's a million, millions of years is a very long time. That's enough to erode continents to sea level in a few tens of millions of years. Here's a planation surface that's effectively untouched for 100 million years. There's something very inconsistent, something very wrong with that explanation. Obviously, these flat landscapes cannot be that old, but they are clear evidence, I believe, there's something very wrong with the dating methodology being used. And I believe the observations then, they're not proof of, but they fit very well, with the floodwaters retreating from the land during Noah's flood, the recessive stage of Noah's flood. High-speed water currents moving over very wide areas, carrying rocks of many sizes, planing surfaces flat, and gradually as waters lowered, planing surfaces flat at lower elevations and uh, grow moving from high altitudes towards sea level, that's exactly what we see today. Present-day erosion is too fast for planation surfaces to be tens of millions of years old, but they're great evidence for the flood. So much for planation surfaces. My final piece of evidence of geomorphology is what we would call water gaps. Many rivers, after travelling along a valley, will suddenly appear to turn, from our point of view, and flow through a narrow gorge that cuts across some major barrier. The mountains where you see that low point on the slide at the bottom with the marked X. It's only a couple of miles away, and yet it didn't do that. It's a complete mystery why this Shoshon River should have continued eastward, oblivious, as it were, to the mountainous obstacle in its way, cutting this incredible gorge. Clearly, rivers do not flow uphill. But how could it have done so, then? Here's another one. The Delaware Water Gap is probably the most famous one, like a a ridge of land or a plateau 
or even a mountain range. And we call those resulting gorges or valleys water gaps. And you can see one at the top there uh, where the Shoshone River, uh, starting at Yellowstone National Park in the USA, flows east straight through the Rattlesnake Mountains as if they weren't there. But what's fascinating is that that river could easily have continued in a slightly more southerly route, gone round